Hello everyone. Um, today I wanted to talk to you about a set of rules called Sword and Spear, which are written by a chap called Mark Lewis, who goes by the name of Paul Kovnik on the internet. Um, they're a set of rules designed for ancient and medieval battles, um, fairly large scale ones, so larger than a skirmish game. But um, in fact, as I, I hope I'll show you a little bit later, you don't need that many figures to play a game using this set of rules. And um, I found it uh, quite convenient just to um, use a lot of my individually based figures that I have for a number of skirmish games like Saga. Um, once you've got a, a a good collection of individual figures for a game like Saga, it's very easy to put them onto bases and use this set of rules. And um, I really admire this set of rules. They they are now my go-to set of rules for um, any game of, of set in the ancient or medieval periods. Um, they were published originally about a year and a half, two years ago. And um, they were, it was, Mark went through a self-publishing firm called Lulu um, but they've proved so popular um, in particular a guy called Neil Shuck who you may have heard of um, wrote a very good review of them in Miniature War Games and they have certainly drawn a great deal of uh, critical acclaim right the way across the, across the world um, they, they're popular in Australia in particular um, so after, well, last November, um, a second edition of the rules came out, which are now published by Great Escape Games. Um, so they're, they're, it's more of a mainstream publisher. So hopefully they'll, uh, they'll become more, um, widely known and, uh, played in clubs and so on. Um, down here in Plymouth, uh, the War Games Club is very um, keen on Field of Glory. Um, and I introduced this set of rules to the club and discovered that um, there were a large number of people who were interested in the ancient and medieval period but weren't interested in Field of Glory. So a whole load of people came out of the woodwork who found these rules very enjoyable um, but who, who didn't have any interest in Field of Glory and it, and it seems, I mean that was the path that I took as well really I used to use a set of rules called Armati um, I'd played Field of Glory but never really enjoyed the games too much and Sword and Spear was like a breath of fresh air um, as I say I can highly recommend it but what I'm hoping to do is to play through a game uh, using my <coughs> excuse me, hundred years war figures, um, my twenty eight mil figures, and um, give you an idea of the how the rules play and what a game is like using this set of rules. Um, that rather than waffle on too long, um, with you just staring at a at a screen of uh, of the rules. So you will need a set of rules. Obviously, um, the second edition has got some slight rule changes, not too many, from the first edition. Um, so, if you did if you did purchase the original edition, um, you can easily use that with the errata from the and amendments from the forum. Um, there's there is a, a specific forum for. Paul Kovnik Productions. Uh, Mark Lewis has written a couple of other sets of rules and um, he's developing a fantasy version of this set of rules as well. Um, so you can find Paul Kovnik Productions on the, on the web and um, there you will find um, a very comprehensive uh, set of army lists for the entire ancient and medieval period. But unlike in the first edition, the second edition does have um, a sample selection of army lists. Not really enough to get you going, um, 
but there's there, there's enough there to give you an idea of how it works. But essentially, um, go to the web, find the army that you're going to be playing with, and download um, the Excel um, spreadsheet. And from that, you can then um, amend the spreadsheet to conform to the armies that you have. Now, I, I'm going to be playing a game using, um, as I said, my 100 Years War figures. Um, so I've downloaded um, the late medieval English and the late medieval French spreadsheets. Um, deleted the uh, units that I don't have and duplicated the units that I do um, so that I've built up two armies. I'll go through this list <coughs> in a little bit more detail with you later um, but essentially there are each army has a certain number of core troops or a certain selection of core troops and a certain selection of support troops now, um, in the core troops, you will find that there are certain units that it is compulsory to include, and they have a C against their entry here under the restriction table. And there are also certain units that are restricted in that you can't have too many of them, um, and they have an R against their entry. Now, if they're core troops and they have an R, you're allowed to have two of those units, maximum of two. If they're support troops and they're restricted, you're only allowed one. <coughs> um, there are a number of uh, specifications for each unit. Um, and again, I'll go through that more with you when I'm actually playing the game. Um, but they have a discipline level, a strength level, um, a description of what kind of armour they have, which is the protection level. Um, they have a, If they have missiles, it will tell you what kind of uh, weapon they're firing those missiles with. Um, they have various melee characteristics. Um, they have various other characteristics. And... Um, all those characteristics and abilities combined will give them a points value <coughs> um, so that you can then calculate the total points value of your army. So I've got, as I say, I've got two armies here. Um, the English army, um, I've also included what is known as a stratagem, um, which is to give the longbowmen stakes. Um, and that actually increases the value of this army by five points per unit of longbowmen. So I've got four units of longbowmen. So I've actually got 20 more points than this um, total here indicates. So I've got 421 points of English and 427 points of French. So more, a more or less balanced uh, battle that we're going to be playing. Okay, the next thing you'll need is some kind of tape measure. And um, I introduced that at this point because um, it's related to how you base your units. Um, in this game, it doesn't matter how you base your units as long as both armies conform to the same system. Um, so as I said earlier, I have actually used a lot of my individually based figures that I have um, already for Saga, games like Saga and I simply put those onto movement trays and use them in that way. But once you've uh, decided on the size of your unit, um, the frontage size is important because you take half that distance and that, that then becomes what's known as a DU or distance unit. And that is then how um, ranges of uh, weapons and movement distances are calculated. Um, so half the frontage of a unit is one DU. Now, um, as it happens, as time has gone by, um, most ancient and medieval game systems have employed what is known now as DBX 
um, because it originally arose from the basing systems used by games such as DBA and DBM. And um, essentially in that, you base your figures um, with on bases that are either <coughs> 60 centimetres for 28 mil figures or 40, sorry, 6 centimetres for 28 mil figures or 4 centimetres for 15 mil figures. Um, and then you make your units up of um, either two or four bases, depending on whether they're cavalry or infantry. Um, so for a 28 mil game, which is what I'm going to play, um, my units are going to therefore be uh, 12 centimetres wide. And that means that a DU becomes six centimetres. So that is how I calculate my ranges and move distances. Then the next thing you'll need is dice, and the game employs D6s. Um, there are two kinds of dice that you're going to need. Um, one are the dice that are generated by the units that you have in your army. So you could describe those as activation die or action die. Um, but you get one for each unit that you have in your army. So my English army has ten units, so I'm going to give them yellow dice, and they have ten yellow dice. And my French army has nine units, and they are going to have blue dice. Um, so they have nine blue dice, and they are my activation dice, and those are going to go into a bag um, for selection during the game. Um, so I'm very fortunate to have um, one of these splendid dice bags, uh, which has been knitted by Annie Norman, the dice bag lady. Um, sadly, I don't think she now does to customise dice bags because she had a lot of repetitive strain injury but um, I've fortunately obtained this from her before she stopped uh, crocheting these things and she's um, manufactured this one with the um, uh, family kind of heraldry of the Astley family um, which is perfect for a medieval game but it's also perfect for me because if I use it for a game of ancients or something like that it's clearly my um, my dice bag because it's got my um, family heraldry on it. So those dice are all going to go into this bag for selection later. Um, but you will also require a selection of dice to roll whilst you're um, calculating the results of melees and shooting and so on. Um, so you want to have a similar kind of colour scheme, hopefully. But um, So I've got blue for the French, yellow for the English, but don't have them um, the same size. So I've got larger dice, otherwise you're going to end up getting them muddled up. And dice discipline in this game is cr critical um, because you don't want to get confused about what dice is doing what. And um, that's basically all you need. So um, the next thing to do, I'm going to play this on a six foot by four table and um, at the moment that table is blank so I'm not going to show it to you at the moment but um, you have to put some scenery down on it and there are various ways of doing that. Um, you can recreate a, a historic battlefield if you, if you, if you want to um, but there is a, a system for randomly generating terrain and <coughs> the way that excuse me the way that works is that you roll two dice per player so this is the English dice roll um, and they've rolled a one and a three and you roll two dice for the other player oh they've got one and three as well now what those values represent is the maximum and minimum number of terrain pieces that that player is allowed to position on the table um, now I'm going to be playing both, I'm playing a solo game so I'm going to be playing both sides um, so it is a little bit odd in that respect but Sword and Spear actually does work very well for solo games I've discovered but 
not in every respect. Um, and I'm going to have to kind of like put myself in the position of each individual player. And I know that the way the armies are composed, um, the French have a lot of cavalry that is going to operate more efficiently in open terrain. So I don't want a lot of terrain on the table from the French point of view. So they are going to opt to only put one piece on the table, whereas the English are the other way around. Three is really too few for them. Um, so they're going to want to opt for the maximum that... Uh, that they can go for. So the next thing is to select the types of terrain that each player wants to put on the table. Okay, now again there are limits on um, the types of uh, terrain pieces you can put on the table. Um, the French are only going to be putting one piece down which means that they're not allowed to put a hill down because you can't put more than half the number of pieces you've uh, opted for to represent hills. So the French are going to go for a very simple um, open sort of field which is going to be have to designated as rough going. Okay, so that's going to be the French. The English on the other hand um, are allowed to put a hill down. So they're going to go for this hill, um, <clears throat> which is going to be defined as a rocky hill, so it is rough going, same as that French field. Um, they will also have another field, um, which again would be rough going, and um, they have to have... Um, no more than half as difficult, but at least half as rough or difficult. So they are allowed to have one difficult piece of terrain, um, the idea being to slow the French cavalry down as much as possible. So they are going to have a wood, um, which is defined as, rough, as difficult going rather than rough going. Um, so that's the, the four terrain pieces opted for and then there's also a system for putting them down on the table you basically roll dice where is it there we go you roll dice it tells you where to put it down and then you roll another dice to adjust the movement so i'm going to do all that without you uh, watching the dice rolls and then show you how the table ends up okay well the um the tables ended up quite bare um, the woods ended up being taken off the table because the French player was given the option with the dice rolls of removing it, um, which he did, which means that there's now a six foot table with two fields that are rough going and a hill which is rough going and that's it. So it's worked out quite well for the the French in that respect. Um, the dice that I put on the table, this is the English side of the table and those dice there represent the deployment zone. So the hill in the centre um, isn't quite within the English deployment zone and over on the other side of the table the French deployment zone um, is a nice open space. Um, with one field just in front there which might hamper their progress. So the next thing is to um, deploy the armies and there's quite a nice sort of scouting um, mechanism which I'll show you next to determine who puts their pieces down first and so on. Okay so each player has to bid a certain number of their activation dice um, and the person who bids the most out scouts the opponent. Now this is one of those instances where um, it doesn't work quite well playing solo because obviously I know what the opponent will be bidding. So I'm going to um, 
cut to the chase as it were and um, say that as the French um, would prefer to outscout the English I'm going to say that they bid three dice whereas the English only bid two so they win the bidding now those five dice in total don't go into the combat bag at the beginning of the game they'll only go in for the sec from the second turn onwards now um, which means that if you do spend a lot of uh, dice on scouting um, you're going to be at a slight disadvantage for the first turn Oh, and by the way, um, you also add to this total the number of light horse units that you have, not exceeding, um, if you have got a lot of them, the number of dice that you bid, but neither army has any light horse in this game, so um, that doesn't apply for this game. Okay, so the English have to first of all put down any heavy foot and the baggage train, and... For this game, I haven't included a camp or a baggage train because it does slightly alter the way the game is played. Um, but players of Fog will be accustomed to doing that. So um, in this game, you have an option. In Fog, you don't. Um, so on the English left flank, I have a unit there of Gascon um, men-at-arms. They're not... Um, I don't know what Gascons would have actually looked like. I suspect not much different from their English allies. So um, I've just used the group of uh, figures from Irregular there. Um, then I've left a gap here because um, there's a unit of longbowmen going to go in there, but the French don't know that. Then there's a unit of billmen. Um, and then comes a unit of dismounted men-at-arms uh, the yellow dice there is representing the front of the deployment zone there's another group of dismounted men-at-arms another gap for some longbowmen and finally another unit of billmen now um, obviously the longbowmen aren't on the table yet um, but I am planning to put the majority of them over on this side here um, because uh, there's mainly crop fields and so on over this side so hopefully that will slow down the French advance um, but this deployment zone is simply that um, once the game begins it's perfectly acceptable to um, manoeuvre out onto this flank here um, so this could pose a problem for the English but um, I, I'm intending to bring out some English longbowmen across this way to hopefully get uh, some arrows loose onto this part of the field here. So next up, the French now have to do the same and put down their baggage train, which doesn't exist, and their heavy foot. And the only heavy foot that the French have is this unit of spearmen, which I put on their left flank. flank. Um, so the rest of their deployment zone is still empty, so the English still have no idea of where the attack is really going to come from. Um, but I've left it up to the spearmen, if necessary, to advance across these um, cornfields, because they will have a uh, much better fighting chance in those than the cavalry would. Right, so the English have now deployed their medium foot and their cavalry. Um, so on the right flank here, um, we've got a unit of longbowmen. And I've put their stakes on the, uh, the table, but they're not deployed. Um, so you put them behind the unit um, whilst they're not deployed. Um, because... Um, uh, it's becoming obvious that this flank here is not the threatened flank. Um, so those longbowmen are probably going to have to um, move out and around in order to um, come within range of the French. Um, there's another unit of longbowmen there, same thing, stakes not deployed. And then this is the, th the flank that, which is obviously where the threat is going to be. 
because there's a nice clear patch in front of them for the cavalry to charge. So here I have deployed a unit of uh, longbowmen with their stakes already set, um, ready to receive the charge. But um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this unit here I've got ready um, to manoeuvre out onto this flank here. Um, but they're going to have a bit of a problem. Um, the French are probably going to be across the field quite swiftly um, before they get a chance to join the end of this line here and get their uh, stakes placed. Um, so to give them a little bit of assistance, I've got the English cavalry behind them there and hopefully they'll be able to uh, get out onto this flank as well. and. Um, try and foil the French attack to an extent. Um, so now it's down to the French to deploy all their medium foot and cavalry which is going to be the bulk of their army. So that's going on the table next. So no surprises then. I've put all seven units of the French uh, cavalry um, over on the, their right flank facing this uh, weaker English flank there and their aim is going to be ready to fan out into this nice open space here and try and get across the field before those Englishmen manage to get their stakes in the ground. And the only other unit that the French had to put on the table was this unit of crossbowmen here which are medium foot and I've put them directly opposite the hill um, partly because there are no English longbowmen over in that area and partly because their crossbows will um, uh, counter the heavy armour that those English knights are wearing. Um, so they should hopefully get a few pot shots in on them. Um, so the next thing to do now is to place the commanders and any skirmishers. And neither side has any skirmishers, so it's just a matter of putting the commanders down on the table now. And for each army I've got one general and two captains. So there you can see um, my English general, which is Edward the Black Prince. And um, I've attached him to this unit of English cavalry here. Um, there's not a lot of point in not attaching um, commanders to units. Uh, they still have a, a command radius um, measured from the unit they're attached to. Um, so the general of each army has a command radius of 8 distance units, which in this case would be 48 centimetres. And um, this is an English captain here, which I've attached to this unit of longbowmen. Um, again, because that will make it easier for him to, or for rather for me, to uh, motivate these longbowmen and uh, it should make it easier for them to get out onto this flank. And the other English captain is way over the other side of the line here. He's attached to that unit of longbowmen there. And he'll be doing the same job of trying to get those longbowmen um, around so that they get within range of the French as rapidly as possible. Now with the French I've taken a bit of a gamble. I've got uh, the French general there, King John, <coughs> um, attached to that unit of cavalry, and I've also attached a captain to this unit of cavalry here. Um, and the other French captain um, I've attached to the medium foot crossbowmen, which might seem a little bit odd, but um, those crossbowmen are very poorly disciplined, so they're very hard to. Um, to move, um, so attaching the captain to them will make it easier for to, to get them forward. But that does mean now that this unit of French spearmen way over on the left flank are outside of command radius, command distance, which means that they're going to be harder to move um, and to give orders to. But um, I think they've served their purpose of acting as a kind of feint. Um, so I'm just going to allow them to kind of uh, 
uh, sort of move quite slowly um, and, and sort of uh, pose a, a sort of vague threat to the English. Um, and I can always move this captain over closer to them later on in the game. But um, the priority is really to get things moving over this side of the battlefield as quickly as possible. So that's the deployment, so now we're ready to play the first round of the game. So the English had or have 10 units, um, so they generate 10 dice. The French have 9 units, so they generate 9 dice. But in the first turn, um, the French had bid 3 dice and the English had bid 2 dice for the scouting. So those are going to be re removed from play for the first turn. And then the rest of these dice are going to go into the bag. So we give the bag a shake. And we draw out seven dice. So obviously it's an odd number, so one side is going to predominate. One side is going to have more dice than the other. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um... And that's um, lucky to begin with for the French, because there are four French dice there, even though there were more English dice in the bag, and only three English. So the, for the first phase of the first turn, um, the French are going to be the active player. And while, while I'm on this um, point, this is, this is a good time to mention this, um, that some of the people who have... Uh, criticise these rules, say it's um, it doesn't feel right that you're only activating a limited number of your units per turn, but in fact they've got that slightly wrong because this isn't the entire turn, this is just one phase of the first turn. Um, so during the first turn, yes it's true I won't be able to activate all of my units, but it's certainly not the case that I'm only activating seven of them. You'll, you'll see how it works um, as we go on. So let's put the English dice to one side for the moment. And you take the four French dice and you roll them. <coughs> okay, so I've got not particularly high scores there. A six, a three, and two twos. Now, I then have to look at the discipline levels of each of the French units and um, I put these dice alongside certain units. Right, so we're getting to the nitty gritty of it now. Um, if you take a unit of French cavalry, um, they have a discipline level of three. Um, if you add a commander to them, that guy there, it reduces their level, discipline level down to two, which means if I place a two against them, um, they can make a simple advance. Um, so by placing one of those dice there, I can move them forward, nothing else. Um, if I were to place a higher level dice on them, it means I can do more with them. Um, one of the uh, characteristics of these French knights is that they are undrilled. Um, now normally, if you were to put a three on them, it would mean that they could make a manoeuvre, which would mean they could change direction, um, something like that, or do some special task. But because they're undrilled, you require a dice roll too high to do that. Um, and I'm a bit limited on fours in what I rolled. So what I've chosen to do is to place two dice with the two facing on them and that allows me a bonus um, which means I can move further forward. I can move one DU extra further forward. So that is why I've got two, two facings against them. Um, here um, this is a unit uh, discipline of three, which has come down to a two because the general is attached. Um, so I put the three dice on them. They still can't do a manoeuvre because it would require a four to manoeuvre, but it will allow them to move forward. 
And over here, on these guys here, I've put the six facing. Um, so that means that they can do anything with that six, so they can basically manoeuvre. Um, so my intention is, and they will get a, uh, with the six they get a, an increased uh, bonus as well. Um, so they'll be able to move one DU further. So my intention with them is to move them across this way as well. So I'm getting even more onto the, uh, the English flank there. And only now do the reactive side, the English side, roll their dice um, to see what they, they get and to then place them. So the English take their three dice and roll those. Um, right, the one is bad news because you can't do anything with that, so you have to put that to one side. Um, this is one of the cases where, as I was saying, dice discipline is important. That mustn't go anywhere on the table um, close to a unit and be mistaken for another dice and it mustn't definitely mustn't go back in the bag so you just put that to one side for the time being and then um, the rest of the dice I've got two fours there <coughs> so I again as in with that double two I could put the two together on one unit to get a bonus or I could use them with a unit of discipline three to do a manoeuvre or discipline four to do a straightforward advance. So um, I'll work out what I'm going to do um, and then show you the result after. Okay, what I've decided to do is put both of them onto that unit of longbowmen there to give them a bonus. Now, medium foot have normally have a movement distance of three DU, which in this game would be 18 centimetres. But because they're carrying their stakes, that goes down to two. So um, their discipline four, I believe, I'll just have to check that. Yeah, their discipline four. So that means that um, with the commander, they go down to a three. So a four will allow them to manoeuvre. And the other four will give them a a bonus distance of 1 DU, so their movement rate of 3 DU, which had been reduced to 2 DU by the stakes, goes up to 3 DU again. So that is perfect to allow them to join the edge of the line there, which is all I really want them to do. Um, so when I get to move them, they'll be able to join that line, but they still won't be able to deploy their stakes. Um, that's a manoeuvre in its own right but at least I'll have got them into the sort of position that I want. Right, now the other quite neat thing about this set of rules is that um, you now have to activate the units in ascending order of uh, dice facing, beginning with the active player, which means that this unit that have a two on them have to move first. So it is quite important that you don't, say, put the two in the unit behind and the three in front because then you'll find these guys behind can't move because they're hindered by the guys in the front. So all these people can do is a straightforward advance, but they do get a bonus. Um, so cavalry normally move 4 DU, so they can move 5 DU forward, which is 30 centimetres. And you are allowed to shift 1 DU either side as you move. So that's... 30 straight forward, and then I'm going to shift them 1 DU, which is 6 centimetres, to their left, so they're not getting too dangerous close to the edge of the table. And then you keep the dice that they've used next to them, but you turn the face into a 1 to indicate that the um, dice have been used. Um, now there are no 2s on the English side there's only dice facing four so I know the next thing I have to move is this three um, so these guys can move 5 DU which is 30 centimeters the facing to one 
keep the generals attached to them. And then the next thing to do will be any fours, which is the English side over here. So <clears throat> the English are allowed to make a manoeuvre, and they can move 18 centimetres, which will take them so that they are literally lined up here. With the manoeuvres, you don't have to worry about face facing directions and that kind of thing. As long as no point on the base moves more than the distance allowed, you're fine. Um, and as I say, the stakes are still not um, attached. The, the um, deployed rather. The, the captain is attached to them, but he's just representative, so he could be anywhere. He's within the unit, so it doesn't matter where you place him. Um, and again, they go down to a one. And the only other thing left to move now is that unit of cavalry there with the six. I've just moved this unit back one because I realised I, I gave them the bonus distance move. They were only allowed to move 24 centimetres, so I moved them back a little bit. Okay, so these guys here, they have the bonus of, uh, as a result of having that 6, so they can move 5 DU, which is 30 centimetres, and because they're discipline 3, it allows them to manoeuvre on a 5, so they can go any direction they want, basically, and then end up facing as long as their no point of their base is, moves more than 30 centimetres. So I'm going to move them way over here, that's 30 centimetres to there, And change that facing to a one. And that is the end of the first phase of the first turn. So now we're going to draw another seven dice from the bag. Right, well, as it happens, there are only um, seven dice left in the bag for the first turn because of the, um, the way we spent money on scouting. And um, as expected, because the French got a good. Um, grouping last time it's going to be English predominate in this phase so the English can have five dice and the French two so the English are now the active player so we roll their dice see what we get um, so those twos might be usable um, and we've got a six a four and a three so again, I'll work out what I'm going to do with those and then show you the result in a moment. Right, well the English have been a little bit unlucky because um, they don't have any uh, Discipline 3 units with a commander attached, which means that they can't use these two dice. Um, so unfortunately they're just going to get put to one side uh, for this turn which means I've only got three dice to play with, so I put the six on this cavalry, which will give them a bonus move, so they should be able to get quite a long way around um, to this flank here. And then um, over this side, I want to start moving some of these troops around to get into the uh, fray. So um, I've got a unit of longbowmen there, normally discipline four, that's come down to a three because the captain is attached. So I can use that three to move them forward as a straightforward advance. And I've put the four on this unit of longbowmen here who haven't got a captain attached, so they are disciplined four. So again, they can just make a straightforward advance. And the rough going doesn't alter their uh, um, movement rate for medium foot, so they'll be fine just to move across and a shit, little bit of a shift to the left there. So now we have to see what the French are going to do with their two dice. Okay, so the French roll their dice. Now it is important to wait until after the active player has placed their dice um, so that the active player doesn't know the strength of the dice roll of the reactive player. So here we go. Um, so again, a two, which might... I don't think I'm going to be able to use the two. Um, and a six, which give me a bonus. Um, the other thing I should have said was that once a unit has been activated and you turn the dice to a one, you can't give them another dice for that turn. So you can't, uh, you can't activate a unit twice in one turn. Um, right. 
right, so again, I'll think about what I'm going to do with those two dice and then show you the outcome in a moment. Yeah, as expected, the two wasn't any use, so I had to discard that, and I placed the six on those knights there, so they can make a similar manoeuvre as their neighbours did a moment ago, and manoeuvre across to join beside them. Um, so I'm building up quite a nice sort of uh, flank attack here. So we then play out those dice um, in ascending order, starting with the active player. So I'm starting with the three, um, which is this unit of longbowmen here. So they can only make a standard advance, which would be normally 3DU for medium foot, but they're carrying their stakes, so it's down to 2DU, which is 12 centimetres. Again, the rough going doesn't affect their movement as they're medium foot. And they are allowed to make a 1DU shimmy to the left, which is what they're going to do. stakes with them and the captain attached. Um, that goes to one. Then if there were only threes on the other side I would move the French next, French threes, but there isn't. There's only a six. So I know the order in which the units are going to move. It's going to be this four followed by the active players six followed by the reactive players six. So I'm now going to move these guys next. Same thing again. 12 centimetres forward, 6 centimetres to the left. You can move and fire um, at a reduced effect, but uh, they're out of range at the moment. And then next up will become those um, English cavalry. Okay, so they've got a six, so they're allowed an extra DU of movement, which means they can move 30 centimetres. So what I'm planning to do is to actually <coughs> manoeuvre them so they're facing that way. Even though they'll be a little bit behind this group here, if I keep them far enough back, they will be able to shift a little bit to the left if they make an advance. And it will be easier to... Um, move them um, if they're making a straight forward advance rather than a manoeuvre. So I want to change their facing basically so they're facing that way. So um, that's that corner there. We'll get to there. If I change them like that. You can see that, yep. That goes to a one. And the general remains attached. Um, the reason I was hesitating then was just to make sure I don't think I've caused a problem with anything falling out of command radius. No, I haven't because I've still got uh, the captain in a good place over there. Right, and the only other thing to do is now to move the French unit. So I know um, from having measured it before that I can just move this unit, because they started off alongside that unit and they've got the same movement allowance so I can put them there like that and that is the end of all the action phases of the first turn so now there's an end phase where um, you're allowed to move your generals and to do any rallying of losses but there hasn't been any as, as such as yet um, so I'm going to think about uh, moving my commanders around and then let you know the upshot of that. Okay, the only change I've decided to make is to move this uh, captain here from this unit and attach him to that unit there. Um, they move at the speed of light horse, um, so he's got plenty of movement range, so he's going to move to there. Now the reason I've done that is that it will make this unit here easier to activating the next turn 
and what I want to try and aim to do is to charge these longbowmen before they get a chance to deploy their uh, stakes so we'll have to see how the dice work out um, another um, issue with these rules that some people have said is that if you look here I've got two units of cavalry facing off against the line of uh, English infantry and um, some people have said because you're activating a single unit at a time and then um, you play the melee instantly um, that it makes it very hard for a line especially with ancient battles for a line to charge another line as a line but there is there is um, a provision in the rules that if you place the same um, dice number dice facing against both of those units say you can move them simultaneously um, and that's an often overlooked rule in um, sword and spear um, you can also make group moves but you can't make a group move to charge um, but the way you get one line to charge another is to hope that you get um, lots of uh, similar dice facings that you can place against all those all those units that you want to charge um, but in this instance I'm keen to get into those longbowmen before they put their stakes down because um, that can cause what well, it does cause a big problem so the next part of the end phase is to pick up all the uh, activation dice and put them all back in the bag including those ones that in the first turn we used to um, bid for scouting.